Okay, this is Modbus Data Communication Systems, presented by Carol and Steve Mackay, Carol Moberly, in our London office. Hi, Tesh, can you text in the box where you're located, and um, we'll do the recording. We've probably got about 80 people who want the recording, so it's a worthwhile exercise. Um, most of this material is covered in our uh, textbooks, Industrial Data Communications. So really what you want to do is do a quick introduction to Modbus, and then look at some of the troubleshooting issues. So I'm going to look at Modbus from a serial point of view, and obviously its dominant uh, use now is obviously in Ethernet as well, so I'm going to look at that. Oh, thanks. Uh, hi, Tish, good to see you're in Sydney, two hours ahead of us, seven, three minutes past seven. Welcome to the uh, team here. Um, we'll make it a little bit shorter than normal because we don't have as many people. We sometimes have up to... Um, 30, 40 people, but most of the people are going to be looking through recording. So, quick review of the Modbus protocol and some troubleshooting issues. Um, that's what I'm uh, be looking at. So, introduction to Modbus and then some simple troubleshooting um, issues. Um, and so, I've just got a colleague here who's just going to log on as well. He just wants to do an audit. But I've just sent it through to him. Um, Okay, so we're now going to look at Modbus protocol. What is it? Troubleshooting Modbus, and then a quick conclusion tying it all together. So pretty straightforward. Um, first question is, uh, hi, Tech, have you, hi, Tesh, sorry, have you used um, Modbus before? Maybe you can just text in the box if you have. It'd be interesting to know. Andrew, presumably you can't hear us. So the structure of the Modbus protocol is extremely simple, and that's probably one of the main reasons why it's been so successful. It is a master-slave protocol, which means that I, the master, send out requests to you as a slave, and of course you get a response back. Ah, oh, okay, good, We're working in the building management field. Excellent, good to hear that, hi Tesh. Modbus is probably not used as extensively in building management as it is in, um, in the industrial automation business where it's extensively used. I must say I'm always a bit surprised that Modbus is still around because it's a fairly primitive protocol, but I think one of the great successes is that it's simple. And the good old principle of KISS is very important. Ah, uh, I'm sorry you lost me. Uh, your <coughs> I see your um, audio has been disabled for some reason. Uh, Carol, we've got a problem with the audio, I think, with... Oh, it's back again. Okay. Ah. Okay. Dion and hi, Tesh, we can, you can presumably hear me now. I see your audio has been enabled. Hello, Dion. Uh, presumably you can hear me, Dion. Presumably you can hear me, Dion. Ah, great. Excellent. Okay, there was a problem with hi, Tesh's audio. Nothing ever surprises me when you've got new software. There's always potential problems, as we know, Carol. Um, so I just want to look at the protocol. It's a very simple protocol, and Dion, uh, it follows the KISS principle. Dion's one of our gurus with Modbus. I was trying to inveigle him into running a lab, but he's, it's a bit of extra work. Uh, look at the function codes, and obviously Modbus, R2, and ASCII. Uh, just want to do a comparison between the two. And obviously, just look at troubleshooting Modbus. Troubleshooting Modbus can be a little bit frustrating sometimes. I remember doing a gas reinjection compressor system many years ago, and uh, there was a slight problem with our protocol message. And of course, if the message is um, damaged or incorrectly structured, you don't get any, you may not get any response at all. So it can be a little bit of a problem there. <coughs> so. Uh, the application layer, and Dion can go into this in quite exquisite detail, but it's application layer, OSI layer 7. Basically, you've got a, every protocol is broken up into seven layers. Uh, we're not going to worry too much about this, but essentially you've got the physical layer at the bottom, which is the copper cable or the wireless link, and then the second layer is the data link layer, which is, of course, the raw structure, such as Ethernet or Modbus. And the application layer at the top is what? makes things happen. So this is a 
request response type protocol um, for the Ethernet structure. So here you've got a master-slave interaction, Modbus client and a server request and a response. There's a Modbus transaction. I'm not going to worry too much about that. I'm going to look at a specific example of a Modbus code. So here's a typical uh, structure of a Modbus message. You've got the address of the slave. Where you're sending it to, slave number four. Function code, what you want to do, and effectively here, you may want to read or write an analog or digital. Obviously, it's all digitized, but an analog could be a 4 to 20 milliamp loop. And in this field here, you have your data. And then this error check field is what they call the CRC16, cyclic redundancy check 16. And I've had the privilege of writing a bit of code with that. Um, it's using lots of shift registers. But essentially, the error check gives you a unique fingerprint of the message. So if there's an error in the message and you're sending some critical instruction down, please uh, put the carbon rods into the nuclear reactor. You obviously want to make sure it's done properly. Uh, so error checking is quite important. So CRC16 is pretty reliable. Uh, here's a typical example of a message. Um, you get terms such as coils used, which are digital outputs, discrete inputs, input registers, and holding registers. Holding registers are effectively um, registers where you uh, read or write a analog 16-bit value, or you only may write to 12 bits. Input registers are analog inputs or stuff that's coming into your remote device, and you'll want to read them. So two types of modes, RTU and ASCII. Um, the RTU mode, uh, again, gives you the structure here. I'm not going to worry too much about this. This is in the slides. Uh, eight data bits, even, odd, or no parity. You can make a choice on that. Again, very much used by the RS-232 approach, um, a little bit of a museum piece often. Um, and that's the sort of structure there of a message frame. ASCII mode would be very unusual to see today. Um, Dion, I don't know if you've ever seen ASCII mode used. Um, I haven't seen it used much. It's um, pretty well um, non-existent these days. The reason is simply that the, um, the uh, RTU mode is a lot more compact. Function codes, here's an example of some of the function codes that we've got. So reading coils, function code 01. You can see the function code setting switch is set up there, function code. Uh, here's your request. The request is from the master down to the slave, and the response is back. And then read discrete input discretes. You've got the request and the response. So again, you'll see uh, read input discretes of basically in digital inputs, 16 inputs, uh, you can read back. Can you also see that everything here is in hexadecimal notation? Basically, 8-bit chunks or 4-bit chunks. Hex is a 4-bit uh, binary equivalent. So it goes from um, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, A, B, C, D, E, F. Read mo there's a few other instructions here. Write coils, which means you want to write to a digital output. You want to drive a motor on from your master. So you send a write coil, which means digital output, which is a feed from your remote device out. Write single register, where you write to a register, 16-bit register. And force multiple coils, where you want multiple coils. You probably find most of the time the um, write single register or write multiple registers is more than adequate there. Um, so that's the general structure that we've got. And as I said, it all revolves around this little, if I can summarize it, this little structure here. So here's your um, Mindbus frame, unit identifier, where which slave you're going to, function code, read or write, analog or digital, data that you're sending down and reading back, and the CRC. So these, this structure is true for both reading and the response. So sending a request down 
and getting a response back. That's the structure. Very, very simple. As I said, Dion follows the good old KISS principle. <clears throat> um, now, just to look at some troubleshooting techniques, and I think Dion here may have some comments to make, but basically you could have hardware problems or software problems. So um, there's quite a few other issues here which I don't really have the time to talk about here, but they're worth mentioning, and that is when you're reading and writing analog and digital values from a remote device using Modbus, it's always a good idea to block the memory locations so they're all next to each other. So in other words, when you're reading a block of addresses, it's far more efficient when they all, what they say, contiguous, all next to each other. So typical hardware problems, which is often probably the one, number one problem, is miswired communication cabling, uh, faulty communication interfaces, power may be down, and obviously software issues are invalid function codes. Um, you're trying to address a, a non-existent memory location on the remote device. Those are all very um, are pro problems that you need to identify. So typical hardware tools that we use would be 232 breakout boxes, 485, um, 485 converters, continuity testers, volt meters, screwdrivers, usual stuff, the protocol analyzer, uh, and we'll give an example of one, probably the most famous one is Wireshark, which is probably a little bit of a challenge, hardware troubleshooting, and tr software troubleshooting, which I just want to talk about now. So the idea here is um, there's different levels of troubleshooting. One is at the field level, so looking at the uh, I.O., field bus one, two. Then the next level is at the cell level, or industrial Ethernet, and then probably often to do with um, different PCs uh, in the office. Most, most of the time, we'll be looking down at this level here or this level here for Modbus. So, tools of the trade, cable tester, TCP IP, and I'm just going to run through some of the utilities. This, there will be a complete recording provided to you, so don't get too panic-stricken if you see some of the utilities you're not familiar with. I just want to highlight them. They're very, very useful to do a quick poke at the problem and identify what's wrong. Um, and then obviously the protocol analyzer is when things get a bit more serious. Again, not difficult to use. It's free. So first of all, hardware and physical cabling. Check cable on both sides of the connection. You may be horrified how often that's often the problem or it's connected to the wrong device. Check the switch lights. They're powered up. Make sure you've got the wire type correct. Make sure you've got crossover cable. Probably the most famous problem here is, of course, the good old RS-232 with pins two and three, or uh, often incorrectly pinned, or even RS-485, you may find you've got two transmitters connected all together and you should have the transmitter connected to a receiver. Excessive untwists. This is not really a major problem when you're running your protocol, but uh, you can get electrical noise interference, so you should try and keep your cable twisted right up to the connector. And the other problem, of course, in the good old um, industrial environment with all the noise and fumes and vibration and iron ore in my case in one plant, the RJ45 connector is damaged and obviously rule number one, try and don't use an RJ45 connector, try and use some mil spec military specification connector, otherwise you'll be disappointed. Obviously if you're in a air conditioned, rarefied atmosphere, well yeah, RJ45 is probably fine, but it's actually diabolically unreliable. And then finally, um, yeah, cheers, Andrew. I'm sorry about that. Cheers, Andrew. I'm very sorry that you can't hear. I am very sorry. Uh, we will send you the uh, recording. Um, and then obviously electrical noise and shielding, that's the other issue. Now, just to quickly look at some of the utilities, um, and, uh, and I must say, uh, high test, you probably think, what on earth are these utilities? These utilities are very useful just to try and poke the network and see what's going on. So the first one is ping, got the IP address of the remote Modbus slave or master. You can ping it and actually see that it's there. So that's the first one. That's a very quick test. 
And if you've got any difficulties, that ARPA, that gives you a pretty good idea of what the, um, whether the uh, Mac, MAC address, the hardware address, and the IP address are there. MBT stat is quite useful just to get a feeling for the connections and the stats statistics. IP config all is gives you a pretty good idea of the um, the actual. Um, if you look on that there, you can see it gives you a, a bit of an IP address, hardware address, gives you a, a feeling for who the default default gateway is, etc. Trace it, another useful one. People don't use it much, but basically, if you want to go and track over many, many routers your packets are going, your Modbus packets are going through many routers, you want to go and trace them, trace it, and you put the, uh, if you look carefully at that, it's very difficult to see, but they're doing a trace it to medicalsaga.com. They're doing a trace it there, and basically that'll tell you how your packets are traveling. Extremely useful. Where you will pick up a problem is if you suddenly discover there's a massive delay for one of the links between two routers. Final way, final check is obviously the OSI model, <coughs> and that is done with the good old Wireshark packet analysis. And I've mentioned the OSI model before. These are different layers, but basically the uh, Wireshark can look at the data link layer, network layer, transport layer, and application layer. So it's typically what we're looking for, TCP IP protocol and Modbus. And this is a typical packet structure. You can see this is a ping, probably a ping message. And basically, you're just drilling down, actually trying to find out what the message is, who's it from, where's it going to, and uh, what the requirement is. That's quite important. So that's a quick run through on the Modbus protocol. In a, in a nutshell, we'll give you a copy of the recording. Any questions from Hitesh or Dion? Over to you guys. Any questions? Well, thanks um, very much, Hitesh, for listening in. If you have any uh, comments, Dion, do you have any comments from you? Nothing from you. You can text in the box if you have a comment. Maybe you don't have a comment. Anyway, we'll distribute it out to the 80 guys that could make it and were um, attending. But um, hello, Anu Palmer of Ravindra. I'm sorry you're not able to uh, attend. Um, but we'll give you a copy of the recording to all the guys that attended. Uh, for some reason, a new Palmer can't get audio as well, I see. Um, I'll pass it back to Carol. Thanks, Carol, for uh, sitting in on this. Um, any other comments? I'll just go back. Any other comments? Do you have any comments from you? Over to you, buddy.